Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a spectacular show for you this evening. The legendary fighter pilot and multiple world record holder Dick Rutan is here back on the show. And tonight we are going to talk about his stories flying the F-100 in Vietnam and also during the Cold War. It's, it's absolutely fascinating to talk to Dick, and I cannot wait to get him here on the show. Now, before we get started, a few things. First of all, we have just completed one cycle of the Fly to Win Challenge with Social Flight, and uh, that prize is given away, and now we're starting a new one. And so be sure to get and check out the Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices and socialflight.com, where you can find tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations, great things to do, and lots of other programs that, like you have tonight with Social Flight Live. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Bose Aviation and the new A30 headset. This headset is absolutely fantastic, has 20% less clamping force. I've worn it on long flights and it is so, so comfortable and easy to use. And in addition, you can get a free SoundLink micro Bluetooth speaker. This is one of their great Bose products. It's a, a wonderful Bluetooth speaker that comes along with it when you purchase an A30 headset or a Pro Flight Series 2 headset between November 19th and December 23rd, 2023. So you only have until December 23rd to take advantage of this deal. And of course, we are grateful to Bose Aviation for supporting Social Flight and making programs like tonight's show possible for everyone. Now to tonight's guest. As an F-100 Super Sabre pilot in Vietnam, Dick Rutan pioneered the use of tactical jets for what became known as Fast Forward Air Control, or Fast FAC. He flew 325 combat missions and survived an ejection when his aircraft was hit by enemy fire. For his valor in combat, Dick Rutan was awarded a Silver Star and five Distinguished Flying Crosses. Following the war, he became a test pilot and ejected a second time when his aircraft suffered an engine failure. In 1986, Dick Rutan achieved what many consider to be the last great terrestrial aeronautical achievement, piloting the Voyager aircraft on the first nonstop, non-refueled flight around the world. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on his experiences as a fighter pilot during the Vietnam War and afterward during the Cold War. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, the legendary Dick Rutan. I'm gonna bring Dick on the show right now. Right, there we How are. are you doing, Dick? Yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, I got, a, I got a riddle for everybody. You like riddles? Go ahead. Okay, here it is, and I'll tell you the answer at the end of the show, okay? Okay. It's drier. No, I'm sorry, what gets wetter as it dries? What gets wetter as it dries? Anyway, that's the riddle. Wetter than that. Okay, we're going to leave that for everyone. You can put your guesses in the section that uh, is the question and answer, and uh, we'll see if we can figure any of that out. But what gets <laughs> wetter as it dries is uh, your opening part of the show. All right, I need to let's. All right, let's let's jump into this because I want to start by reading what was written for your silver star. And I think this encapsulates so much about what your stories are and who, what you accomplished uh, in, in your fighter days. His phenomenal aggressiveness, superb airmanship, and complete disregard for his personal safety in the face of intense ground fire was instrumental in removing a severe threat to air operations engaged in the interdiction of arms and supplies moving into forward staging areas. That, that really, really embodies everything that I know about you from our time together. Aggressiveness as a pilot, superb airmanship. Tell me about how you got started in what made you that fighter pilot when you, when you arrived in Vietnam. Well, uh, for, for some reason, I always wanted to be a warrior, even from day one. And since I was born in 1938, uh, when I become uh, aware of my surroundings, it was right after World War II, and I became very fascinated about those people that flew out of England over Nazi Germany, where they had an, a real extreme loss rate. <laughs> uh, 
and then I got to thinking about those long missions those guys flew. And not untypical is that uh, they, maybe a whole squadron would go out and only one airplane would come back and all the rest of them were shot down. And that one airplane limped back with wounded on board. And I thought about who are these people? How in the world do they ever get in another airplane the next day and do that all over again with those kind of odds? And I became extremely fascinated about the people that would do that. And it's kind of been a lifelong, a lifelong interest in, in how that happened. And then, of course, the, the big world, the main question was, hey, little Dicky Rutan, uh, did you do that? And that was kind of a gnawing thing. And then I wanted to find out if I could really do that or not. And not only that is that if you, uh, Homo sapiens are, especially the male of the species, uh, they're competitive. You know, we do all kinds of things from cards to football. Uh, but the absolute pinnacle of uh, and human competition is when each of them are in competition for their life. That's the pinnacle. That's the top. Uh, and to be able to to operate in that environment, which would be a warrior in frontline combat, uh, that was to me that was fascinating. Anyway, my my father used to tell me that I was had an adventurous spirit. That even at diapers in our little farm up here in Oregon, that I'd be wandering off and they couldn't find me because I was trying to figure out what was behind the fence or behind the barn or over in the next gully. And that was kind of, uh, I don't know, an innate beginning into Dick's life. So basically you were yearning to be a combat pilot from pretty early age. And, and that's what got you. Then we came, both my brother and I, Bert, uh, uh, we both were equally fascinated with aviation. Uh, of course, I, I wanted to fly them, and Bert wanted to design them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so many years after that, we both came together, and we uh, comp were able to accomplish the, uh, the first unrefueled nonstop flight around the world back in, I think that was 37 years ago. Yeah. So fate, you know, fate's kind of interesting in some places. So um, let's start with uh, making sure people have an understanding of what the aircraft is. I'm going to uh, show a picture of it right now, but the F-100 that was your your aircraft. Tell us a little bit about this plane and what it was like to fly it. Well, my relationship with the F-100 started uh, when I was in high school. And the very first public display of an F-100, which they built them down in, I think it was LAX, uh, came for its first public display, and it was sitting on the ramp at Fresno Air Terminal. And I walked, and I walked up and looked at that airplane, and wow, it was sure different than everything else. You know, it's big intake, and it's really neat lines. And I sat there and fascinated about that airplane. I said, someday, <laughs> someday I'm going to fly one of those airplanes. Uh, that was before we even knew what Vietnam was, but I thought it was going to be in Germany. Uh, someday I'm going to fly that airplane in Germany. And, and that's been kind of a, a single focus uh, for the whole thing, my relationship with the F-100. You've flown the F a lot of was aircraft. First, what was it like it was to fly that? Supersonic flight, uh, first, <laughs> it's the Air Force's first supersonic airplane in level flight. And that's what it was uh, kind of noted for. Uh, at the expense of some uh, other, well, semi-extreme compromises in its flying qualities and its instrumentation and so forth. How did it fit for the job that you were doing in, in Vietnam, uh, being you know, a supersonic aircraft? What was it, how, how was it tailored for what you were doing? Well, uh, to begin with, I was extremely fascinated in aviation, model airplanes. And the very second that I was 16 years old, uh, I got the Solo in a Cessna 120, I think. And then exactly a year from that, I was old enough to get my private license and then became an instructor. And I had a little stint uh, in the Air and I joined the Air Force, but they didn't think I was smart enough to be a pilot. So they said, hey, I'd like to be a navigator. 
and that almost broke my heart. But little did I know that what I was going to learn as a NAV was going to be vital for something I was going to do in the future. Anyway, I became a NAV and uh, uh, in fighters, backseat, radar operator uh, in Iceland. And that was a real cool assignment. Hmm. Uh, but that was before the F-100. Anyway, it was an old F-89D Scorpion. <laughs> it had two rockets fired from the, from the rocket tips. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> our mission was to intercept those airliners that got off course going from the States to Europe. Uh, but if they got off course, we'd be scrambled to go and find them and full afterburner, and we could never catch them. So I thought, <laughs> so we had a joke out there. It was that we were uh, not a deterrent. We were just going to fly and interrupt them. <laughs> and anyway, I played for pilot training, was accepted, and then uh, flew a couple of years out of Travis Air Force Base as a nav uh, back and forth uh, to the Vietnam War in the early 60s. And I uh, started learning about the weather that I was going to face later on. I didn't know it at the time. And then I went to pilot training. When I went to pilot, when I checked into pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base, I had many thousand, well, thousands. I had quite a bit flying time. I was actually a flight instructor. Hmm. But my dream was to go to Air Force pilot training. That was my big goal. Those silver wings were something that, uh, Boy, that was just that, that was a cast me out to me. And uh, when I checked in, when I checked into Laughlin, I says, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to tell anybody that that I'm already a flight instructor or knew how to fly. And so I didn't. And of course, I had a head up. <laughs> I had a head up on everybody else that was just trying to figure out how to do stick and rudder and and maneuver the airplane. And uh, even when I started there, I kept telling everybody, I'm going to graduate number one in my class, and I'm going to get uh, an F-100. And they all says, they haven't given that airplane to an uh, undergraduate pilot training class assignment ever, because it was very difficult to fly. Mm. Uh, it would pitch up. Uh, it, it had a lot of real strange flying qualities. <laughs> Uh, to try to turn it over to a just recently graduated student pilot. Uh, and that was a big joke, you know, everybody thought, uh, you know, I kept talking about it through the whole year in pilot training. And then that day came, and, and since I had a real head start on everybody, I graduated number one in my class. And, uh, and it, it, they sit there, the, the assignments come up, and you don't know what the heck they're going to be, and they're all written on the blackboard, and there's a curtain. Uh, metaphorically, and everybody sits there and waiting to see what the assignments are going to be. And it was given to the um, the top guy in the class, and uh, that happened to be me. So uh, the curtain came curtain came uh, apart, and lo and behold, there were two F 100s available, and everybody sat there in a gasp. <laughs> but there was nobody more surprised. Than the guy that walked up there and picked out one of those F-100s himself, uh, he was actually shocked. And then wow. it was off to Luke Air Force Base and gunnery school for a year, uh, for six months. But there was, uh, you know, in your life you have a couple of memorable things. And and here I was going to get my chance to be a warrior and see if I could even come close to those guys, my heroes of World War II. And i never forget that there was, uh, this is the start of the Vietnam War, and there was a lot of guys coming back that had been in combat already. And it was uh, Luke Air Force Base on a Friday night uh, debacle, I guess, a lot of drinking and stuff. And you know how people that are going to war, how they act, kind of strange sometimes. And that was going on that night. And I just kind of stood back and, and, and kind of reflected on something, and I thought, Dick, <laughs> you have a set of orders to fly the F-100 that you've been dreaming about ever since you're a little kid. And you're going to go to combat and you're going to be a warrior. And I kept thinking there's not another place in this whole world under any other circumstances that I would rather be right then at that time. Wow. So 
your mission, you know, the, the, your goal when you got there was to get into the Misties. T tell everybody what what the Misties are all about. Well, the uh, the, uh, the Misty it was called. It was classified at that time. It was called the Commando Saber, and it was started by uh, Bud Day, uh, Colonel Blood Day, and he was our initial commander. And and they knew that the, pervis the permissiveness for the little airplanes, you know, little Cessnas and stuff, that are typical of forward air controllers in South Vietnam, knew that they could not survive in North Vietnam. And so they had a lot of problems with uh, finding the targets and missing targets and and uh, some other things that were not proper, uh, whatever. And so they says, why don't we try this thing and see if if uh, we can put two people in a training version of the F-100, and we're going to go up there and see if we can survive at that area. And that was just starting just after I got to Phuket. So I was in Phuket for, and then I found then I found out about this Misty thing, and I thought, hey, warrior. <laughs> I started hearing about what those guys were doing. And um, I says, hey, I got to join this. And uh, and they come up, and one of the requirements was obviously the high loss rate they were experiencing. They could only let them go for 120 days. Uh, that was the longest volunteer tour tour that they could do. And but they had to be <clears throat> they had to be a flight lead because you know the qualifications are you're going to direct other airplanes into targets, so you should be qualified as a flight lead. Well, I just got there. And here I am, an undergraduate pilot training with uh, not a whole lot of experience in, as being an Air Force pilot. And they says, ah, no, Rattan, you won't, uh, you won't, we can't upgrade you for six months or more to be a, to be a flight lead. And so <laughs> the squadron commander, I kept bugging him and kept bugging him. And finally, he got sick and tired. He says, okay, Rattan, we're going to make you a flight lead. And uh, they set me up on a on a flight lead mission of which I went up and did some horrible mistakes <laughs> as a flight leader. And I do think I took a 50 caliber round right underneath my seat in the engine bay, I mean in the ammo bay area on that mission. Uh, but I came back and the commander says, Rutan, you're no more a flight lead than I am, but I'm sick and tired of you messing around in here and and uh, get the hell out of here and go to Missy. I'll sign it off. And so <laughs> I was off to the real war, the real exciting, the real exciting part of Missy. But the the mission of the Missies were it's to find uh, mainly on the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, coming out of North Vietnam and Hanoi area, and the supply they call it the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And it would wound in around down through Laos and then back. Down, we call it the Magia Pass, down into South Vietnam, in the lower part of the lower panhandle of North Vietnam, above the Ben Hai River. Anyway, that was our area of operations. But the neatest part of it was that we got to fly alone. And what's even more neater <laughs> is we had our own tanker. And without that tanker, we could not be effective at all. And so we had fuel at our disposal, and that little tanker that set off the coast of North Vietnam was ours. And uh, our mission started, uh, the morning mission started at just right at dawn, and it went all the way to noon. And we made multiple cycles out to pick, our, pick up fuel so that we could be on scene for um, a lot of search and rescue things. Hmm. It's really terrible to run out of fuel and lose one of your buddies. That, uh, that you were not there for. So anyway, that was kind of that was kind of the mission that we had. And then of course the afternoon mission, he showed up at noon, and with his tanker, then he could fly all the way to dark. So hmm. our presence over Laos and uh, Route Pack One, they call it, which is the southern part of uh, of North Vietnam, uh, coverage. And the guys that flew those missions. Uh, if you if you're in an area for six hours every day, you get to know it like the back of your hand. In fact, we even had names for the gunners and the gun sites because how they purported themselves, uh, we could give them names. And uh, you're talking about the enemy gunners. 
caliber site, and he was on a remote karst. I don't know how I ever got on the top of this karst limestone outcropping. But every morning we'd come up and say hello to the kid on the karst. <laughs> and why uh, in the morning he was a 50 caliber, and those 50 calibers have tracers. And if we were on the south side circle, he would shoot on the north side. And then he was always 100 degrees out of sync with us. And so these tracers would flow up and not anywhere near us. And so uh, that kind of incompetency we have to keep. And, uh, and so we made sure that nobody ever took out the kid on the cars. We took care of him. And metaphorically, we'd fly over and deliver box lunches in his mail and stuff, which is just a joke. <laughs> anyway, as a kid on the cars, and a new guy would come up and they say, hey, I'm going to show you a 50 caliber. And we go over and see the kid, and he would shoot, and it wouldn't be anywhere near us. And um, so, <laughs> and every once in a while, you'd run into a, a larger uh, gun sight, you know, 37, 57 millimeter, which are pretty big. And uh, gun sights, and they were in a circle, and they're usually in the Soviet style maybe uh, five or six guns in a, in a classic Soviet style. And in the middle, they would have all their ammo and their uh, fire control direction and their range finders and, and how, can, how they could set up for their computers, which are all manual at that time, uh, to be able to um, be effective on, on ground fire. And those, actually, those were my favorite guys. Wow. I probably went after more guns than I should have. <laughs> but it's just something about if somebody shoots and they're really good, then you're kind of obligated for your fellow, all the rest of the guys that flew up there. If the guy was really good, you're obligated, in, in my opinion, to go back and kill him. And, and so we did. And uh, consequently, over time, a lot of those people up there, they just, we flew over and they wouldn't shoot at us. <laughs> because they knew we would come in and mark them. There would be a flight of uh, 105s with, I don't know, a, six, uh, a stick of six bombs with daisy cutters, and they would come in and turn the gun sight into a sand hill. Hmm. And uh, so we had a little bit of camaraderie now on, on, the big, on the big ones, but the little lower caliber ones, uh, as you fly by a little village on a road, that looked like sparklers. Because everybody shot at you with with AK 47s, or and it wasn't unusual that we'd come back with a, a small round of um, AK in your stabilizer or someplace. But wow. we could find anyway. It's called the college camp. They, the guys are trying to camouflage it. It's called the camouflage college, and the Missy had to be able to find camouflage and learn how to read it, and. Uh, much of the chagrin of the people who were doing the camouflage is in the truck parks and the gun sites. Uh, they'd go out and cut foliage and, and put it all over their truck or all over their gun site. But the problem they didn't, something they didn't know is that the bottom side of a leaf is slightly a different color than the top side. And if you fly over and see this off colored in a perfect six position circle or, or a truck, that was rectangle. I mean, I never saw a truck, but I never missed one either because it had this funny camouflage on it and it was perfectly square. Now, I know the guy that, was, that did the camouflage, he would stem back 10 feet, and if he couldn't see any part of his truck, then he'd probably think he was hidden, not knowing <laughs> that the uh, camouflage was a different color and he stood out sometimes like a sore thumb. Wow. Now you now the 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 F100 supersonic. So when you talk about taking over kind of spotting missions, basically for real low slow aircraft, it's a it's a whole different thing. How how did that work with an aircraft that's meant to go supersonic, but you're trying to spot things and and loiter? Well, obviously it takes a lot of fuel to go supersonic. Uh, the faster you go, the more that you uh, consume mass quantities of fuel and an afterburner would give us about 25 i could be wrong here 25 percent more thrust but it was double the fuel flow in an afterburner hmm. so we really had to be careful of that now the early compromises on in the f100 
Uh, the Air Force made some really stupid mistakes. Uh, they were all excited about getting a supersonic airplane. Wow, it's really good. And then North, North American came back and said, hey, we've got a problem. Is that we were able to give you accurate altitude and airspeed supersonically, and we can also do that subsonically, but we can't do it both. And so the, the great wisdom of the Air Force, not knowing that one hundredth of one percent of the time that the airplane would ever fly supersonically, uh, anyway, they chose that we have all those instruments are accurate supersonic. <laughs> and they thought, wow, that's really great to have a supersonic airplane. And when you're supersonic, you have to have all the instruments correct. Well, BS. And that meant that when you're doing an instrument approach, when you reach minimums like 200 feet, your altimeter will actually read 150 feet below the field elevation. <laughs> and so, and so the, uh, the F-100 pilot, uh, for whatever was on the airspeed indicator, he would mentally uh, make the correction. Like if you were at cruise altitude just going cross country, you'd have to level off, I think it was 600 feet below the altitude. And then of course in your instrument work, uh, uh, you were, you're actually a, lot, a little bit higher depending on what your speed was. But to be in the weather and come down on an instrument approach at, and you reach minimums <laughs> and you see the altimeter that reads 120 feet below the field elevation, uh, it took some getting used to. Wow, yeah, that'd be a little bit concerning <laughs> to say the least. And and so these were were misty flights all done with uh, with the training version with with two with a, a pilot and a, a weapons officer. That's right. What we did as uh, the misties and and what we what the what Bud Day set up was something that saved a lot of misty's life. And that was that we had two pilots and there was not this philosophy of aircraft commander and backseater or, or co-pilot because every other mission, one in, you flew in the front seat as the commander, and the next mission you'd fly in the back. And so we'd watch out for each other. And sometimes in the heat of combat, uh, for your fellow pilot sitting in the back and they would say, hey, pretend, knock it off. There's way too much ground fire. And it's not worth it to subject all their, you know, all of our, our, our fighter bombers that we were controlling, and just to get the hell out of there. And so, at, and that reason, one day you were the boss, the next day you were in the back seat. And I think that was an excellent uh, philosophy that probably saved a lot of us. The you mentioned also that the Misty's. Do, um, rotation you you would be much shorter because of their their loss rate uh, was so high. Tell me a little bit well, about they it. volunteers and they uh, normally the pilots were there for one year. Everybody has their one year tour, and uh, but you probably if you flew it to try to fly one the whole year, the chances of surviving that are <laughs> are really bad. In fact, the very first uh, one of us that, was, that did a second tour, his name is Jonesy Jones, really incredible guy. Anyway, on his 100th mission, he got shot down. Hmm. And, uh, they rescued him, uh, and they brought him back, and he says, darn it, I want to do 100 missions that I can take off and land in the same airplane. <laughs> so after all that, then a day or so, they put him on the schedule, and he went out and flew his real 100th mission. And then he went back to uh, whatever squadron or base and flying in country missions and so forth. So the 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 loss rate in the Misties was really high. It was over twenty five percent, wasn't it? Uh, twenty eight percent. Twenty eight percent loss rate. Some of them were shot down twice. Uh, a couple of them were shot down on their the, the second time and it ended up as prisoners of war. Uh, wow. And then there was the shot down in rescues, the shot down in missing in action, and the shot down in prisoners of war. That was the categories that we had. And so all of that, looking back statistically, that we had a 28% uh, loss rate as misties. Wow. What and was it? What was it like um, 
you basically have to be up front there and then spotting and then staying for the actual attack forces that are behind you. What's it like coordinating with them? Were those F4, F4 phantoms mainly or, or what? Well, the, 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 the typical mission is if you're new to a MISTI, uh, I think you have to fly, a, I forget what it was, but you get your first front seat right on your fifth mission. The other ones were in the back seat. I'm uh, getting trained up. And then you get your front seat ride, and then you're annoyed as a fully qualified, uh, fully qualified Missy forward air controller. Uh, and my very best friend, his name was uh, Howard Williams. And the sad thing is that he didn't want to go to Missy for some reason, but I was so excited about it, I browbeat him into it. And on his fifth mission, uh, he was shot down. And uh, when he landed on the ground, the uh, uh, Laotians caught him and, uh, and chopped him up and buried him. And so we found that out later. And uh, that really kind of broke me up quite a bit because I had talked him into going and doing that mission. And because I was just so excited about what we were doing up there. And that was one of the sad parts. Yeah. Uh, the the missions, you know, like, kind of like a typical mission. Uh, if you're the morning, if you're the morning misty, uh, you would you would uh, you would show for duty probably two and a half hours uh, before before sun up or before takeoff time. And then you go through an intensive uh, intelligence briefing. And we had some really sharp uh, young lieutenant intelligence types. Uh, that would glean all the information about the air order battle that was in our in our AO area uh, about uh, truck parks and things that had been hit and gun sites and maybe rescues and and sometimes somebody would be shot down and uh, there would be no word from them and so we would uh, conduct electronic uh, listening or searches for those people and that would take a long time. And they made up maps in kind of a large book with grease pencil, and they would mark a lot of that activity. So whoever the next missy that was up there, he could more or less, instead of starting from scratch, he could kind of follow on from what the activity was uh, for the day, a uh, couple of days before. And then after that briefing, then you go down for breakfast. And... <laughs> Those guys in Vietnam, there's a couple of memorable things that, that all those guys that, that flew or that was in that went in combat in Vietnam. One is when they opened the door to that airliner the first time and you took your first whiff, it's an unforgettable smell that hits you. Uh, the humidity is stifling and uh, the pungent smell of uh, uh, human, well, okay, there's uh, human waste in the in the fields and then the rotting vegetation and something. And that hits you in the face. And, and that's really some experience that's unforgettable. But after a while, you habituate to that and you don't notice it very much. But in Phuket, uh, we didn't have the best of food either, powdered eggs and things like that. And if you've been, been partying the night before a little bit and you're kind of hung over and you, and you walk into the chow line, the last thing in the world that you want that you have an appetite. And I used to look at that food that we were going to get, you know, the SOS and the greasy bacon and whatever else, powdered eggs. And I look at that and I think, well, there's no way that I can even eat that. And then all of a sudden there's a little voice in the back of your head and it says, Dick, this may be the last decent meal you'll have in a long time. And so with that in your mind, then you'd whiff it down. Ah. Uh, <laughs> And then the two of you, now remember you're fly by yourself, and you join up with whoever's in your back seat on that particular day, or you're in, you were in the back seat, and you ride out to our F-100. It was in the dark, and usually in Vietnam it's kind of uh, visibility is low and it's kind of rainy, foggy, misty a lot of the time. And you go out and find your airplane and you pre-flight it. Uh, we had uh, marking rockets and uh, 220 rounds of 20 millimeter cannon shell. Uh, the normal F-100 had about a thousand rounds, but if you put 
a, a back seat in it and they only give you about 220. And they told us that we were not supposed to use that, only on self-defense or flax suppression or something. Because they didn't want the misties out, you know, you're a Ford air controller, you're not the bomber. Mm. Uh, is kind of the instruction sometimes. But uh, the few of us violated it. In fact, if I remember right, we had violated that when we got shot down. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we were not there. We were not there to survive. We were there. We were there to win the damn war. And those lieutenants and captains, that's what they were there for. And they were extremely frustrated about not being allowed to do what we could have done in combat. I mean, extremely frustrated. And it got so bad sometimes, it's a little wonder we didn't just say, if you don't want to win this damn thing, screw you, we're going home. Kind of an attitude that it, uh, it's just yeah. one of the things you had to deal with. Anyway, you go up to your airplane and you pre-flight it and you check those 14 uh, smoke rockets that you're going to use for marking. And you strap in, you may be still kind of wet because you're doing it pre-flight and in the rain. And every morning at Phuket, about an hour or so before takeoff, I mean, an hour or so before sunrise, every morning there was that lone, that lone F-100 that would roll out to the end of the runway, and then you could hear that afterburner light, and you go down the runway and disappear into a low overcast every single morning. And you're kind of half awake when you hear that, and you wonder, I mean, I never see that guy again. Or who it is, and I knew what they were, in, what was in store for, uh, for their next six-hour tour. Anyway, roll down the runway, and you lift off. And our first rendezvous was off the coast of North Vietnam with their tanker, and it would take about 30 or 40 minutes to go from our home base to the rendezvous and the tanker, and you'd slide in behind him, and then you'd take on a full load of fuel. Because if you're running around at high speed, at low altitude, those airplanes, they suck up a lot of fuel really fast. And then everything's, everything's kind of quiet between the two of us because we'd been there and done that before. We, were, we knew what our jobs were. And it was really kind of a solemn experience. And then at 24,000 feet, you back off of the tanker and make that 90 degree turn to North Vietnam in combat. And we tried to make a different penetration every morning that we could, uh, just to confuse somebody. But anyway, from 24,000 feet to 500 knots uh, at very low altitude, which I'd say, uh, like our, our, our rule, we weren't supposed to go under 4,500 feet. But looking back on it, <laughs> uh, the most dangerous altitude to fly in North Vietnam is 4,500 feet. If you're lower, the big anti-aircraft sites, they can't slew around and do their computer thing to be able to track you. And of course, if you're higher than that, the farther away you are from the gun site, it's more difficult to hit you. But there's that one optimum altitude and it's 4,500 feet. And I think that uh, uh, maybe we didn't realize that at the time or who some dimwit that made that rule thought that it was gonna be higher to protect us. But they had funneled us right into the, uh, to the most lethal time because we flower at 4,500 feet, there's plenty of time for them to slew the gun around and, and get a tracking solution on you and then fire while you're, while you're still in range. Anyway, you descend and then there's a handful of time that you back off the tanker and it's very quiet and solemn and you start descending. Uh, you got the engine running, not an afterburner, but wide open. And you're looking for probably 500 knots indicated as you penetrate. Uh, you put your visor down, make double double sure that uh, your chin strap is tight. And most important is that the ejection seat pins are out and you would check that. Then all your lights and all your uh, emitters are all turned off and then you're ready for combat. And it was very solemn and smooth and the most peaceful, serene place you've ever seen is the, the coastal plain, the farmers of North Vietnam. It's the most peaceful thing you could ever imagine. And pretty soon you get closer and closer. And as soon as the first gun sight sees you, the whole coastline opens up with tracers. And usually it's in the morning 
and the, and the light level is really low and it's the best air show or the best uh, <laughs> gun show you've ever seen with tracers all over the place. Not at you, just kind of barrage, uh, like a big fireworks. Wow. And then once you get coast in, then the war starts. And then it's, uh, it's a lot of activity uh, for finding gun sites or finding targets and, and working different flights. Uh, sometimes you'd have uh, people on fire, some people shot down, uh, rescues, uh, and then back to cycle out and get some more fuel and then come back and work another target. Uh, lots of you'd lights mark all coming. The targets with smoke rockets. Is Very good. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> it's noontime. And you finally lose or depart Vietnamese airspace. And you start climbing up for that 30 or 40 minute flight back home and you take a deep breath and you think, holy sugar. <laughs> uh, yeah, metaphorically, you think about what just happened to you or what you've been through and then you go over to the side of the ramp and throw up. Uh, that's a wow. metaphor, by the way. <laughs> because all of a sudden that activity hits you and uh, you wonder, Wow, I get to do that again. You know, th there's another thing that, that was really interesting, and, and I can remember the first time I ever was shot at, uh, really close. It was the 50 cal with tracers came in right across my canopy, and it was in South Vietnam. And it, it, if you're a warrior, and I and I and I ask a lot of my fellow warriors after that about what their the first handful of microseconds. What was your feeling when you finally realized somebody was going to try to kill you? Uh, and I'll tell you what my experience was, is that I didn't show any fear. I didn't want to duck down or call for my mama or break away. I looked over there at the gunner that was trying to kill me. And I, the first thing in my mind was the audacity of that son of a bitch to try to shoot at me. And then I canceled my bomb run and we were putting some napalm in on some on some tunnels and I canceled that and, and went right after this gun site. And <laughs> I'm alive today because my flight lead says, Rutan, what are you doing? I says, I'm going after that gun. He said, get the hell out of there. <laughs> I says, but sir, he shot at me. <laughs> like I was obligated to go and kill him. And uh, that was kind of my first experience. And then I noticed there was something else happened that uh, you know, everybody has a, uh, adrenaline gland, right? Uh, you can run in, you can run really fast if, if a Bengal tiger is chasing you. Normally you could normally, but there's another thing, I call it a combat gland, and I think it's up here in my neck someplace, a little <laughs> gland, and it's only active when you're shot at. It. And what it pumps into your system is the most incredible endorphin. Uh, uh, I mean, it's very pleasant. And uh, what that what pumps into your system is extremely addictive. Mm. Maybe well, that's why some of those guys that want to do that over and over again. But once that once that adrenaline, that combat gland, I call it, starts pumping it into your system, you want more of it. <laughs> mm. And sometimes later on, I'd go up there. If it wasn't, you know, I get in there and nobody was shooting at you for a while. Then I go down and I'd screw with a gun sight just to get them to shoot at me. <laughs> so like you get the plan going again. Uh, I don't know. That's maybe why I stayed for a double tour and, and ended up getting shot down on my 105th. Uh, well, let, let's talk about that for a minute because I want to talk about this. This Your book, The Next Five Minutes, isn't just obviously about uh, the your flight in Voyager. There's a lot in here about um, your tour, your time in Vietnam and your combat time. You talk about something in the book that I found remarkable, and that is about the high loss rate for combat pilots during their last mission. And that we, you hear these stories of someone being shot down or lost during their last scheduled mission. And I think to the layman, to all of us out here who haven't flown combat, we think, Oh God, what a terrible coincidence. But you talk about it and explain that it's not a coincidence. Tell us a little bit about that. 
No, they're, they're not. And all of a sudden you reach the time that your combat tour is over. And this is the last one. And you know, it's a champagne flight and everybody's gonna be waiting for you when you get back and there's gonna be a fire hose that wets you down and a big sign that congratulations on your last mission, you got a hundred missions or whatever it is. You know what that is? Now you just wanna, you don't wanna go out and do a, <laughs> you don't wanna go out and do just a, uh, a milk run of some kind. You wanna come back with a big bomb damage assessment, some big story <laughs> to tell. And you go out and do something really stupid I guess more or less what Chuck Shaheen and I did, uh, that we got shot down, which turned out to be, it wasn't, it was programmed to be his last mission. But I had probably about 18 more misties for my normal mission, my normal tour. And I just thought I'd go with him since we were buddies back in the same hometown that we had. And I'll never forget that day. It's, hey, Chuck, this is your champagne flight. we're two hometown boys. Why don't I go with you on your last mission? <laughs> and little did I know that uh, that, that was going to be both of our last mission. And I think that, uh, you know, that's real typical. You come back and the old attitude, you shoot down a MIG and you do a victory roll over the field. Uh, there was a the very, un, uh, as an example, it was an in-country guy and he came back on his last mission and he was so head up and he buzzed the field real fast and he pulled back on the stick really hard because he was just showing off and he pulled the wings off the airplane oh and unfortunately it went into a chow hall and killed a bunch of people that were waiting to get on we call it the d ross airplane the airplane to go home and just for somebody showing off that was a tragic thing mm. uh, in our case, it got to be kind of like the same thing. And and finally, well, I think there was a party for five of them. And they were going to, sometime, they were going to fly their last mission. And they had their going away party. And all four of them got shot down. And uh, com- or the ops officer came down and told the commander, he says, hey, do you realize that the, the guys that were in that going away party, four of them were shot down? And the guy says, well, who? Uh, and the other one was a guy named uh, P.K. Robinson. And P.K., they says, where is he? And the commander got on the horn and called up there and told P.K. to get the hell out of the pack or get the hell out of North Vietnam and land at the nearest Allied base, which is in Thailand. And they sent me up there to, to pick him up. They wouldn't even let him fly his airplane home. And mm. so then, rightfully so, they made a big rule that said, hey, nobody is going to know what your last mission is going to be. And I think that that probably saved a lot of guys' lives, that they're not going to know. They know wow. they're close, but they don't know that this is their last mission. And um, the over-exuberance of fighter pilots with their endorphin pump, pump and all that <laughs> combat stuff into their systems, uh, sometimes they would do something really stupid. Tell me about your last flight. Uh, The last mission was the 105th mission of uh, of the Missies. I flew a lot more in country, but I don't even talk about those too much. But the the 105 Missy missions that we flew, there was a truck, the truck parked on the road, and we were trying to, uh, well, we had some very poor uh, bomb, bombing accuracy from some of the airplanes that came up there uh, out of Thailand and so forth. And so we were gonna get some uh, in-country guys that were used to doing troops in combat to come up, and we were gonna put them in and uh, show them that they could really get some good bomb damage ex- expenses. You know, improve the accuracy, improve uh, the targeting. That was going to be our plan. And so we went up there and joined up with these three, the three fellow F-100s from our own base. And these guys are really good. We call them patch wearers or top gun graduates and stuff. These guys are really good. And so Chuck and I looked around and found what we saw was a, a fairly benign area that we didn't have a lot of ground fire to put these guys in and do it safely. and bomb the hell out of the target or the truck that we found, and then maybe we could improve the accuracy. Anyway, that was the plan. 
And so they come up, we rejoined with them, and not having a better target, we just says, well, there's that truck down there sitting on beside the road, all not camouflaged, maybe just laughing at us. And so uh, Chuck Hay went in and marked the target, and they all saw the target. And they said, okay, you're clear and hot. And the first guy rolled in, <laughs> and he missed the target almost as bad as the F4s did. Uh, and so the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't set my gun sight right. And then the two rolled in, and he says, he missed also. <laughs> he said, oh, I forgot to set my altimeter or some other lame excuse. And then three came in, and he didn't do any better than all of them. Okay, now we had this big test plan, right? Now, right now, the test was over. It was a failure. But, but that damn truck was down there, was down there uh, laughing at us. And so then we decided that we'd all go in for high angle strafe, which is stupid because the bullets would tumble long before they hit the ground and they were ineffective. So everybody went around, all three of them went around for high angle strafe and that didn't do anything. And then that truck was still there, that damn truck. And so Chuck being Chuck, and that was his last, his last shell pad mission, he says, I'll fix this guy. And so he rolled in, uh, more or less right on the deck, right down, right down the road to the truck. And it was right beside this big, tall car. So as we were on the way in on the target, I could almost see monkeys right off my right wingtip as we went down. And I looked over Chuck's his shoulder, and he opened fire and blew the hell out of the truck. And he pulled off, bang! fire. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then, uh, fortunately, we were pretty full of fuel at that time. And so we pulled off burning, and we punched the tanks off in the, all the stores and tried to decide whether we're going to go back over the jungle and bail out or to try to, uh, uh, or try to make it to the Gulf. And we were hemorrhaging fuel like mad out of the airplane. And then I remembered that a week before that, I saw an F-105 pilot get shot down and really up close. Uh, I saw the farmers chasing him, and I came around the next time really close. Uh, I could even recognize his face. We were that close. And the farmers had jumped on him, and they decapitated him with machetes. And so remembering that, we just says, well, gee, if we don't make it to the water, we're going to land in that, uh, that farmer area, or we can bail out over the jungle and hope we can get a rescue. Well, I didn't want to jump out in the jungle, and I thought, well, with Chuck, and they said, we decided, okay, we're going to try to make it to the Gulf, although we're dumping fuel, burning like mad. And so uh, we were heading for the water, and I... I could see the fuel gauge unwinding, and I could see how far the coast was coming up. And the pilot would double check, and they say, hey, there's no fine way we're going to make it. Uh, and they said, uh, well, when he came out of afterburner, the fire went out, and they were just dumping fuel. So we decided, well, why don't we relight the afterburner and see if we can, we can use that to, get, to go faster, maybe we can still make it. And so then we thought about, well, maybe the engine bay is full of fuel right now. If we light the afterburner, the whole ass end of the airplane is going to blow off. And so we discussed that a little bit. And, and the three F-100s, they were on our wing. And when he says we're going to relight the afterburner, they came from a wing position up in front of us, looking back at us. So they didn't want to get into the debris if we blew up. And so Chuck says something about if you guys had to hit that damn tank, we wouldn't be in this fix right now. Anyway, we both gomered down and Chuck relit the afterburner and uh, didn't blow up, but the fire started again. And we basically flamed out. Now we're going supersonic uh, and just shy of the coast. Then we had enough speed and the engine finally, <clears throat> the engine finally flamed out. Uh, I watched the fuel gauge go to zero. I always wondered how accurate they were. And that one there was really accurate. <laughs> when it said zero. <laughs> anyway, we knew we had it made, so we just kind of uh, had enough speed that we could get us out safely, reasonably safely off the coast. And uh, both of us ejected. 
and got picked up by a Jolly Green crew and uh, returned back to Phuket. And I decided on the way out, I says, if I can make it, if I can just make it to the water, this is one time, I promised myself. I'd done almost twice of what was expected of me. And I says, I ain't gonna do this anymore. And I wanna go home and see my family and my wife and my brand new daughter. And so that's what happened. We ejected, we got picked up. I told the Colonel, is it okay if I don't go up there anymore? And he says, and he was more than willing to let me go because I was one of the high time Misty guys. And uh, so they let me be flight test and we, got, we went down to Australia and I find that they're very friendly, especially to uh, warriors, remembering what happened to them in World War II and what the Americans did to save the whole country for them. And then it was back to another war. I, I, I love the detail that, that, that you talk about both here on the show and some of the other details here in the book. You talk about your rescue and, and wanting to do everything 100% right and, lo and almost losing your gear. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I'd always been a life support guy. I was a skydiver. I had about 54 sport parachute jumps. And uh, I was a survival. I wanted to go to all the survival schools. And one thing I was very, uh, very careful about is every time I'd get checked into the squadron, they would assign you a parachute. And I would put the parachute on and being a skydiver, I knew how to adjust it in the crotch area to make sure that the twins weren't gonna be crushed or anything. <laughs> and a lot of people learned that the hard way. <laughs> anyway, I fit it up and I reached down and I grabbed the, the D-ring and I'd pull the parachute. Of course, the, the parachute would, the spring would jump out and the parachute would fall on the, on the floor. And the, of course, the personal equipment sergeant, he would just about had a conniption. And I says, gather it up. You and I are going to go to repack. And uh, and I go and watch him repack my own parachute, the one that someday I was going to really need it. And as a skydiver, we repacked our own anyway. And so I did that. And I told him that there nobody was to touch my parachute without my presence. And I was, uh, and I pre-flight my ejection seat more than I did the airplane, uh, knowing that I was going to do that. Anyway, we were, we're in the water in the raft. It was a really nice day. It was warm, and the Gulf of Tonkin was smooth, and I couldn't imagine how clear it was. Uh, the water was clear, and I sat there for a couple, three hours, waiting for the Jollies to come up north and pick us up, Jolly Green helicopter guys. And finally, they came, and I said, okay, now i got to learn. i gotta, I'm going to impress these guys that I really know what I'm doing. See? So when they come over, you're supposed to get out of your raft and swim away, and they come over and hover and they drop this horse collar that you put it on and you gotta put it on correctly and being hoisted into the helicopter. So I'm gonna really impress them and I know what I'm doing. So I threw my helmet and all my detritus and stuff out in the water and I crawled out of my semi-warm raft and I'm swimming in the water and the damn Jolly Green came up and landed. <laughs> landed, taxied up to me and I thought, Damn, <laughs> you know, I could have got in without him getting wet. Uh, I was really shocked about that. So anyway, the PJ pulled me in and then I looked out and there was a raft and a whole bunch of stuff floating around that looked like, you know, I, uh, I really, uh, what is it? You spoiled the area by a bunch of trash. <laughs> and then the PJ, <laughs> so I sat there and watched him. He had to jump in the water and round all this stuff up and bring it wow. in. And then all of a sudden I was stuck with all the stuff that we had to use to get home. Uh, through Da Nang, through the hospital, uh, bumming a ride in a little caribou airplane back down to our home base in Phuket. We got in there very late at night in a driving rainstorm. And then we were back home. Wow. And I asked the guys, they said, why in the hell didn't you come out and pick us up at the cargo ramp? And they looked at me and he says, pick you up. I says, you know how hard it's raining out there? <laughs> yeah. Well, both Chuck and I knew damn well how much it was raining because we had to walk back, dragging our rafts, uh, sopping wet. But I tell you what, 
I was very happy because I got to do everything that I wanted to do. I proved myself that I could be a warrior and I could be one of those guys that actually flew for his country. Yeah. And I, and I was very proud of what all of us had done. And, and down deep inside, I was really proud that, that even that little kid, Dickie Rutan, who could actually do that also. Wow. And after after two tours in Vietnam, you well, it's managed a to tour. Tour because remember we were there for a year, and then they only take what four months out of that to be a Misty. Yeah. And so uh, my double Misty tour uh, took up the better part of the half of, of my normal tour, and so wow. I, it worked out all right. I got to go home. I got to go to Sydney and drink some of their really good beer. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a halfway point to try to get you to back to the land of the big BX again. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, as kind of our, our last opportunity for a story of you're flying during the Cold War and your second ejection. Well, the Cold War was totally different. And we spent four years, uh, especially in F-100, it was a single seat fighter. And normally uh, a nuclear weapon is controlled by two people. It always has to have, we call it a no alone zone. But since we had only one pilot in the airplane, and then we controlled over that Mark 61, 100 pounds or more. And if they set it just right, it could become a, a, uh, a hydrogen bomb, which would be five times stronger than the one that they dropped in Hiroshima. And here it was that they turned over one of those weapons to one person, and hopefully that he would drop it in the right place. Uh, that was quite a deal. And I, I thought that was really a response, an incredible responsibility for the people who did set what we call Victor Alert, which was nuclear alert. And we did that for four years out of Turkey and, and uh, Italy and a couple other places right next to the Iron Curtain. And sitting in a bunker with a one megaton thermonuclear bomb dropped to, you know, strapped to your airplane. And you sat there on alert waiting for that horn to go off. And the red light, the scramble light to go off. And thinking, uh, some people ask, they says, would these guys really go and do that? And I says, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that that horn went off, every single one of those guys on the work would have flown their mission, even though uh, the majority of them were all one way. And most of us knew that it was a one way mission. Not one of them would have hesitated. Speaks a lot for the warrior. Yeah. What was your oh, role yeah. in that? Well, that one there, there was, I was on a test, I was a functional test flight on an airplane that had a whole bunch of work done on it. And I went out and did all the tests and some of it was negative G and there was an oil sample bottle in the oil tank and it floated up under negative G <laughs> and positioned itself just perfectly into the intake from the oil tank and blocked the oil flow. And being a test pilot, I got a, some really good, accurate test information on that engine. And I can tell you that that engine will run perfectly for 12 and a half minutes, and then it will explode. And I obtained that data on a personal, <laughs> personally. Uh, and unfortunately, wow. that 12 and a half minutes was, uh, well, they launched me off in bad weather because they, they needed the airplane really bad and really actually really poor weather. It was supposed to have almost clear and five miles visibility. This thing here was about 602, but uh, the mission was required. And so Rutan, how about you fly it? <laughs> Damn right, I'll do anything, you know, to further the mission. And so he blasted off and flew in solid weather all the way to 42,000 feet out over the North Sea and did the test Oil pressure went to zero, and I almost made it home. As we're breaking out about 400 feet 
uh, just breaking out of the weather, the engine blew up. And I grabbed the ejection handles and squeezed the triggers. The parachute opened. I swung about three times and went right into the trees. Mm. Uh, that was also a memorable experience. I can only imagine. Well, um, I do want to make sure I do justice to how you looked in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I want to make sure that I, that I get this uh, uh, set up here because this is yes, this is actually the definitive book on the air war over North Vietnam, and it was written by General Don Shepard, and he did an, an absolutely outstanding job. And he had he chronicled about five of his misses, and I was honored to be one of them. But uh, uh, it says various upside down. <laughs> But the last, the last part of it was that I, I always want, everybody wants to go back to their, their battle area, you know, back where you were, uh, back to the war, right where you fought. See, it's always, and so anyway, about, uh, well, God, it was almost two decades. I rounded up five other missies and we went back and toured the area of operation. And I wanted to stand on the spot in North Vietnam with a, damn truck was. <laughs> I can see it from the other perspective. <laughs> and there was a lot of other sites up there that uh, uh, some really large battles that were fought. And a lot of people died on both sides of that equation. And uh, so five of us went back there and uh, we toured around and we had a different perspective about what it was like on the ground. Uh, Don uh, did that. Anyway, after our tour, we were about ready to leave North Vietnam, the six of us. Yeah, six of us. And we were at uh, Saigon at that time, ready to get on, to ready to get into the airplane the next day to leave. After touring uh, up in North Vietnam and some interesting places. And so we were sitting there, it was in the Rex Hotel up on the roof, where many of the um, correspondence would meet uh, during the Vietnam War itself. And at the end of the evening, we were all sitting there and, and uh, we knew it was over for us that we were going to go home. And so Don says that, that I stood up and I said, gentlemen, a toast. And I says, when your flying days are over and from this world we pass, may they bury us upside down so the whole world can kiss our ass. Anyway, the next morning, those five misties got in the airplane as they taxied out to take off from Tonsonu for the last time. They looked out the window, and they saw a six position. Uh, they saw us. Uh, well, uh, they saw a 57 or 50, uh, 57 millimeter gun sight, the ones that we fought on. And we looked, and I realized only this time, it was not pointed at us. Hmm. Wow. Well, Dick, thank you so, so much for sharing your story, for your service to our country and, um, and everything you've done for, for aviation. Um, I want to make sure, again, everyone sees um, your book, The Next Five Minutes, absolutely spectacular, an amazing read for anyone who has a chance to, to do that. Please go and, and get that book. And then the other book that you mentioned, uh, um, as well, various upside down to learn more about the Misties. Uh, I am grateful that you've come on our show more than once. And, and for one more thing, that's the riddle. Ah, the riddle. Tell us. Yeah, what gets wetter as it dries? And the answer is uh, a bath towel after you take a shower. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> it gets wetter as it dries you. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, anyway, this has been great. And uh, Jeff, you did a pretty fine job and it's enjoyable. Invite me back again anytime. Oh, my God. I would love to have you back on the show. We will look forward that, to that as a treat for everyone else here. So, again, I am grateful for, for everything that you have contributed to aviation for your life and your service to our country and for coming on the show. So thanks so much, Dick. I look forward to speaking to you again very, very soon.
it's uh, it was an honor to serve my country under difficult circumstances. Hmm. Well, have a wonderful evening. Uh, you too. Thank you. Good night. It's all about. <laughs> it's all about. What was it you said? It's all about liberty. Yes. Thank and you so flag. much. Have a wonderful evening, Dick. Good night. So. And thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday, December 12th at 8 p.m. with Jason Morrison of Rebuild Rescue. You've watched him on YouTube. He does some amazing aircraft re restorations from complete derelicts. Rebuild Rescue, very cool. He's a great guy and going to be here on the show to join us. On Tuesday, December 19th, Barry and Brian Schiff will be here on the show. You can bet that that will be both educational and a whole lot of fun. So I cannot wait for that show and a very special holiday show. On Tuesday, December 26th, Robert Hayes from Airplane the Movie will be coming back here on Social Flight Live. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight, and I wish you all blue skies.